Thanks very much. And uh, let me greet everyone who is present here. Program director, <coughs> the problem with politicians at this time is not easy for them to give their biographies. Uh, maybe if you go to the IEC, they might have a, <coughs> a better biography uh, for today. First, let me start by saying that the problem when you are exiting, sometimes others are nervous. Uh, others might be too excited, others are worried. I'm only left with uh, one day. After that, I'm no longer a member of parliament. Uh, as you know, parliament is officially closing for the fifth term on Wednesday. So even if you ask me questions now, you may not get the answer. You rather, <laughs> you, you rather wait for the next chairperson of the committee to give you the answers. But also you must ask yourself a question. If you ask those, those, those questions, if I give you a wrong answer, by the time you realize Wednesday is a wrong answer, I'll be gone. <coughs> But I tried, I had a very long discussion with the few staff that we have in Parliament on whether you wanted a speech or you wanted a presentation. And if you wanted a presentation, can you have a presentation on benefits to the economy and harm to the environment? It's, it's, it's a very awkward one. And I dare say this thing to everyone who's here. With my little experience, mining is a very complex industry. It's not just as simple as extracting a commodity beneath the soil or even on surface. It's much more complex than that. Leave its legacies that uh, I'm sure many of us still uh, live on it. And I, I was interested to uh, say to the Minerals Council of South Africa, but I told Mr. Vaud, I said, no, why are you leaving? My simple job for the past five years was to be a political law enforcement agency on the industry. And I was saying to him, if I was a police officer, and I'm asked a question, I would say it's very difficult to catch a criminal. But because the criminal is in the house, ask him why he's stepping or shooting people. So it should be the minerals industry that answers about mining. I can only account to what extent we have tried to control the manner in which they are doing mining. So those are two different things. So <clears throat> if you... If, if we have not done our work, it will be simple because we may not have done enough to make it a point that there are benefits, but at the same time, there's limited danger in the environment. But let me also start by saying it is complex because those who remember very well, there was a National General Council of the ruling party which almost ended up in chaos on the debate on mineral beneficiation that the country should go. And the young people at that time argued strongly that there was a need to nationalize uh, <coughs> the mineral wealth beneath the soil, which therefore led to a research commission that produced about 382 pages on state interventions in the minerals sector. Those who know it popularly is what is called the Sims Report. So the point one is trying to illustrate here is that others might argue that, and I dare say, let me declare one part. My background history has been in the trade union movement. And amongst other things, those who know, we led a very strong campaign to ban labor brokers. I'm not sure whether 
it's easy to ban something that is a matter of trade. I'm not saying it can't. So the big, one of the complex issues, there is a view that says ban mining. There is a view that says regulate mining. There is a view that says there is no need to regulate mining because you are making it impossible for investors. So we live in a world of contradictions. We will continue to share different views. But there is only one thing I always share, which is my history of the background. I can assure you, even those that are affected by mining, they could even be mostly affected by mining. Uh, for trade unions, I used to tell them, you can't survive without the employer. The same person you complain to be exploiting you is the same person if exploitation were to end, it will mean your end of usefulness. So sometimes our own existence is also coupled by the fact that there is something that is unjust that we are fighting against. And therefore, in that seems report, on the rare, rare earth element, this is what it says, and I quote, these metals have not been included in this analysis as the methodology chosen would give them a very limited weight as a result of their economic value. Close quote. The global demand for rare earth metals has increased as some uses for these elements are found. Today, there are almost hundreds uses of them. And I'm sure we saw, I'm not going to go back, we, we initially had included, we've saw, we have seen the usefulness of what this rare earth element is all about. The opportunities for South Africa in mining from rare earth element presented at, in that conference, therefore, even today, are intense and wide-ranging. They describe part of what President Ramaphosa envisaged when he, when he spoke and said and talked about mining as a sunrise sector in the economy. At first call, the first call here is to make the most of South Africa's mineral resources for the benefit of all South Africans. Let's just undermine for the benefit of all South Africans. That is the, that is the first issue. The Minister of Mineral Resources used to say the mining industry has got a potential to thrive, but at the same time, it has got a potential to squeeze itself out. And I will explain why we, we raise those issues. The second call is to draw on the technical competency and experiences of the industry in, the, in this country. South, Afri South African-based mining engineers, geologists, ventilation specialists, and chemists have been responsible for innovations that have led to the world mining industry. This expertise needs to be used to the maximum benefit now and further developed for the future of rare earth metals by offering education and employment to young South Africans. The mining industry has been described as the cornerstone of the economy. It provides a firm and wide base that can be available to other sectors to improve their competitiveness. Mining constructs and relies mining constructs and relies on infrastructure often in remote rural areas that can open possibilities for jobs, service provision and even manufacturing and industries. When the, Min the Minerals Council of South Africa spoke here, one of the issues that they didn't raise about the Australian example is that in Australia, in Perth, for the, for the three months, mine workers are flown from their place of residence to their place of work. That thousand kilometers is not traveled by road. It's a, tra it's a thousand kilometers that they flown in and out. I'm not saying in South Africa we should do the same. But also we must accept that the landscape is different. We've got very deep mines compared to what you have in Australia. That is another difference that we're having. We're not saying it, it should be done. But the biggest problem is that in South Africa we have not defined 
how do we deal with mineral beneficiation? This is my personal view. It's wrong sometimes to come to meetings and say this. I'm raising this thing because mining in South Africa has got a potential to divide the nation more than we may think. <clears throat> the reason I'm saying because people who are from the inland, particularly Gauteng, Northwest, and Pumalang, when you talk about mineral beneficiation, they think you talk about them, which might be correct. But the risk is that quite soon those who are in the coastal line are going to say if you were born far from the sea, you are not supposed to be seen as a person who must benefit from the sea. That is unfortunately, I, I don't belong to that field, it's not mine, but I'm just cautioning, I always caution to this thing to say, as South African, if we talk about beneficiation as a nation, then it should not be limited. Quite soon, people will start to say, go to the Durban port and check how many people have got businesses and how many people are being employed who are not from the coast areas. So it has got a potential that as we continue to demand and begin to say, if you happen by accident of biological birth that you were never born next to the mines, you should not be the one who's going to benef beneficiate regardless of who you are. I'm saying the risk is high that you will be told if you are never born in Cape Town or next to Port Elizabeth or East London or Richards Bay, you should not be the one who will also benefit to what is going to be accrued. So you may have people telling you that you want to export you go as far as a certain point of destination. When you are about to reach our borders, now let's tell you that it is trade on our terms. I'm not saying it will happen now. It is not my wish. But at times when I look at it, I think it's much more, it's much more complex. But it may not have a reason now. It doesn't mean in future it will not. The mining industry... The mining industry has been described as the cornerstone of the economy. It, pro it, it provides firm and wide base that can be available. Oh, I've dealt with this. Sometimes mining is called the flywheel of the economy of South Africa. A flywheel is a heavy wheel that can provide energy even if you are not helping to turn it all the time. This is the 400 billion mining contributes to the national economic wealth every year. Because of all the people it employs, the services and the goods it buys, and the, the valuable minerals it produces, precious stones and metals, building material coal. And you can add to that the rare earth elements which today we are discussing. The point we are saying, we are looking at how much mining is making as a contribution in the economy of this country. But we need to deal also with some of the weaknesses and limitations, in particular harm to communities and environment. I'm not disputing that argument that said you must ban mining. The reason I say mining is quite complex, at least at this bit now, even if I were to go and do my studies in mining, I'm sure we'll know what is the entry point. The first problem with mining is that some of us are even beginning to question whether you must come to Johannesburg these days. Is that as long as we don't have, which is one part, we don't have a clear strategy on the early closure of mines, we are still going to have a problem. But the second thing is that if you close mining, then you must take the consequences. The, that is the point I was raising about my previous life, to say bad labor brokers, I can tell you could have been much easier. Part of the problem, which later on I'm going to expand more, is that in South Africa, the only commodity that you have that is globally managed and globally regulated is diamond. Those who talk to me, they'll tell you about the Kimberley process. The rest of our commodities 
are absolutely only for our own inward export purposes. One of them is gold. So you can close gold. It doesn't mean they are not going to mine. The potential that you are increasing the problem of illegal mining. And the reason I'm saying coming to Joburg now, they will tell you that at any given moment, the N2, N2, N3, Deben, can collapse at any given moment because in the process of mining, there were pillars that were not mined. And for illegal miners, they don't have a limitation when they mine. They mine even those pillars. Because to them, is to sell. Equally, they will tell you now, the Council for Geoscience, if it was invited here, would be telling you on the study that in your 90,000 capacity stadium, there is a potential to, due to illegal mining that they could mine and that stadium would collapse. And part of what we asked the Department of Mineral Resources was that, can you please quantify, and this is what people don't know, we have said that department is not necessarily or just the Department of Mineral Resources per se. It has to find a way to go beyond that because what you have currently is a historical legacy of mining that was absolutely unregulated pre-1994. That is what you have. And the problem with legislation, it doesn't apply retrospectively. When they were doing mining, they would have been doing mining according to the laws that were there at that moment. Now what we said is that, please do a risk quantification, how much it will cost to deal with what we call derelict and ownerless mines. Because if, if we don't address that issue, we cannot leave a situation where you only deal with disasters as and when they happen. I'm sure because you are here, just not far away here from Springs, a young, child, a young boy went through a hole and he has never been found up until today. Why? It's because the manner in which that area was rehabilitated, just with few rains and so forth, it opened. And it went down because the water, but uh, I know water they said there is true. Because the water is highly contaminated, it is believed that that child was dissolved a few minutes of going down. So the chance is to find. Unfortunately, these are some of the things we have to take into consideration when we deal with the issues. So I'm not saying you cannot, you, we can't deal with those issues, but we have to understand how complex some of these issues are. One of the things, again, as I will explain, the biggest problem is that with mining, it has changed different phrases, the many hands. One case, we went to Ivanda in Pumalanga, where you've got about 1,000 graves. We wanted to know who are mining here. We only realized that the mining companies have changed hands 13 times since that time, those people. Were. So when you try to look for this one, this one says, oh, it was not me, it was so and so. Some of them have been liquidated. So this is one part. So I thought it's important. And that was been asked to reflect on how mining may do harm to communities and the environment. And in Parliament, we have had regular briefings from experts and other stakeholders. I must say here is a limitation of Parliament, and, and, and sometimes people don't understand this thing. We might be sometimes not doing enough, but we must also understand. If you were to ask how much a department has, in terms of its staff turnover, and then go to committees of parliament. I can tell you in my committee, all of them, by the way, it's a standard practice. You've got a researcher, you've got a content advisor, so it's just a content advisor, whether what you wrote or is written is correct. Three, you've got a secretary of the committee. Four, you've got an assistant committee secretary. That's what you have. Four. How many DGs? You get one DG in a department, you will get about seven DGs. Leave sometimes even the advisors. You've got a minister, you've got a deputy minister, you've got all these people must account to 11. 11 members of the committee. And 
Now let me explain where then it becomes worse. A committee of parliament meets once a week. People think that we meet every... It meets once a week because most members of the committees from different political parties don't serve in one committee. So you have to accommodate. Others can afford to have meetings every day because their members might be, serve, might have one mem might be serving in one committee. But generally others, they serve in more than even two committees. So you meet once. In essence, it says you've got four days in a month to meet as a committee. Except mine, at least start early. The earliest committee when it starts is half past nine. And by one o'clock must be finished. But most of them, they start at ten. So you can calculate. I, I always prefer to be practical. You can calculate the time between 10 and 1 o'clock. It means a committee meets for three hours in a period of a week. And that three hours, when you put it, it says in a month they've got 12 hours. So you will understand the complexness. What then makes it worse is that, which is what we have argued. I only thought it's important to explain something. What makes it worse is that Parliament's budget is determined by the executive. So you must do an oversight to the executive, but it's the executive that gives you the budget. So how much you can monitor us financially or or in otherwise, is determined by the same people that you must monitor. So the Minister of Finance gives you money as Parliament. This is how much you are supposed to have. And a committee of Parliament in a quarter, in a quarter, meets, it goes out for a, it's too much for a week, but let's say for a week, it goes out in a week, in each and every quarter. It means in a year four times. So I'm raising this thing not because, not because I'm saying there's something wrong or put excuses, but we must be practical. Part of the argument we have said is that you need to build capacity, internal capacity, on the legislature so that it can be able to do its effective work on what has to be done. But also you need to consider whether Parliament should not, you say we copied what we found there, whether it shouldn't change the manner in which it is operating. Wouldn't you be nice to, we are just making things, wouldn't it be nice to have three months out of Parliament could go and do the work and then come back to process for two months or so and then say this is what has to be done. Rather than what we have, it's, it's a discussion that we hope is going to continue going forward. And therefore, the point we are trying to say is that in as much as you have got a duty to make an oversight exercise, the complex nature again of how parliament operates becomes a limited example.